Christine Milne. Welcome to Insiders. Thank you, Fran. Senator, events are unfolding very quickly and quite dramatically in Iraq. You've called on Tony Abbott and Bill Shorten not to take us into another war in Iraq. But what should Australia do if Iraq is very clearly calling for international help? Should Australia and the world stand back or should we go in and give some kind of military support? Well, certainly the situation in Iraq is horrendous. You only have to see the number of civilian deaths and the uh, horrific assault uh, that's going on there. Uh, but following the Americans into another war is not going to fix it. Uh, I thought we should have learnt by now from all the way with LBJ, uh, learnt from the lie that uh, John Howard uh, took us into Iraq with in, in that instance. And what I'm saying is we need to be uh, working in the United Nations, but it will not serve Australia's interests to just follow the United States into another mess in Iraq. There's and that phrase, we Australia's need independent interests. foreign policy. I noticed that Bill Shorten said we should only get involved or the test for sending troops to Iraq, and there is no, I should say, stress no talk of troops in Iraq at the moment, would be in the Australian national interest. But is that the test? I mean, you say go to the UN. The UN has been unable to do very unable to do much at all in Syria to help. Is there a responsibility for a country like Australia and others beyond our national interests? Is there, you know, the right to protect doctrine, for instance? Should that come to play at any point? And would you be um, easy with that at, if, it came, if it came to that? Well, our global responsibility is through the United Nations, and it always has been. We need to forge our own way in terms of foreign policy. I think many Australians will be uncomfortable at the extent to which Tony Abbott has now thrown in our lot with the United States in terms of uh, cementing yet more bases, yet more troops, yet more engagement. We do not want to follow the United States blindly, as John Howard did. And clearly, it didn't work last time in Iraq, and it won't work at this time. I I think we should stress that uh, for, for people listening that there has been no request and there if uh, in terms of there is talk about any kind of military uh, international involvement in Iraq really there doesn't seem to be a major role for Australia at this time but if Australia is asked to contribute militarily to assist the Iraqi government against this kind of um, march by the, uh, the Sunni extremists should Tony Abbott should the Prime Minister bring it to the Australian Parliament before he commits? Well, the Australian Greens have always said uh, that the decision to send people to war should be a decision of the Parliament. That has always been our position and it remains our position. We should never be just allowing the executive to run along blindly uh, following the United States as John Howard did. It is not the way we ought to go and it's time that we changed uh, the situation in Australia and did bring these questions to the Parliament. But I reiterate again, our global engagement has to be through the United Nations, not just just as a follower of the United States. Let's go to the Prime Minister's trip more broadly now. Climate change was discussed in the talks with Tony Abbott and the US President. And those in the room say that the US President acknowledged that Tony Abbott had the support of the people at the last election to scrap a price on carbon and pursue his direct action policy. If the US President can see it, why can't you? Well, I think uh, the US President was being polite at best to Tony Abbott. Here we had our Prime Minister embarrassing us again on the global stage. I mean, at one level, he's a climate denier embracing the Canadians in trying to get their climate denial club going and being rejected by the, US, by the United Kingdom and by uh, New Zealand, for example. Then we have him going to the United States, our climate denying, coal promoting, conservationist Prime Minister. Uh, and then we have him end up in Houston uh, absolutely rallying for the coal industry. He just says anything that he thinks the audience want to hear. He doesn't care that it's totally contradictory one day to the next. And he certainly, uh, in terms of climate denial, he still obviously believes climate change is crap. What the United States President did get was a concession that energy efficiency would be on the agenda in the G20 and what that means is mandatory vehicle fuel efficiency standards and that's where Tony Abbott will have to concede this. You mentioned the, um, uh, we were just discussing there, the energy conference in, in Houston, Texas and the speech by Tony Abbott. Let's have a little listen to it because Tony Abbott was quite deliberately talking up coal. Let's have a look. For many decades at least, coal will continue to fuel human progress 
as an affordable, dependable energy source for wealthy and developing countries alike. I want to repeat that. Coal will continue to fuel human progress. As I say, quite deliberate at the end of this trip where climate change has been a bit of a theme. Do you think that combined with the uh, position, the combined position with Can Canada, Canada, about Canada, about the, um, about the job destroying climate tax, um, that this is a, a bit of a pushback from Australia and Canada combined in the lead up to, the, to next year's UN climate conference? Well, clearly it is. Uh, and what a shocking thing that our Prime Minister is trying to undermine the rest of the world achieving a treaty to address global warming uh, by 2015 in Paris. Uh, clearly, he wants to undermine it. He wants to reinforce massive coal exports, huge damage uh, as a result of extreme weather. And here we are before the World Heritage Committee this week, uh, where they'll be deciding whether to put the Great Barrier Reef on the endanger list, uh, where they'll be rejecting Australia, I hope, in terms of removing forests from the World Heritage Area. I mean, he is last century's man. He's a climate denying last century man. He's a huge opportunity cost to Australia, because while he might might go celebrating and putting on his Stetson in, in uh, Texas. The reality is the best opportunity for investment and jobs is in decarbonising energy and that's why I'll be moving in the Senate uh, this week to bring on the Clean Energy Finance Corporation bill and have it uh, absolutely put to the vote so that we reject Tony Abbott's effort to destroy renewable energy investment in Australia. That'll set up a double dissolution trigger and make it very clear to Australians that the Greens are going to stand firm for a clean energy, renewable energy future as opposed to the Prime Minister's last century coal uh, global warming destroying future that he wants. So just to be clear here, before the Greens lose their sort of key balance of power role, because that'll be diluted in the new Senate after July, you're going to try and set up a trigger of the Clean Energy Finance Corporation. What does that do, though? There's no pressure on Tony Abbott to use that trigger, pull that trigger, is it? He might go to the people on a carbon tax, unlikely to go to them on a clean energy finance corporation, I would have thought. Well, it sets up the absolute debate in Australia. Do you want a future powered by renewable energy or do you want to abandon all efforts to address global warming and head back to the old dig it up, cut it down, ship it away past that is destroying the planet and landing us up with extreme weather events and all those opportunity costs. Let's talk about the Greens and is there some inconsistency in your position? As I say, you're going to lose your balance of power uh, prominence uh, in the new parliament. You've got two weeks left. Will you use that to try, for instance, and to support Tony Abbott in passing the increase in fuel indexation? Because on the face of it, uh, a rise in the price of petrol is a policy that fits right in with the Greens' philosophy. Well, what an extraordinary statement that the Prime Minister made in his meeting with President Obama to say that the fuel excise in Australia is a carbon tax. This is the man who doesn't believe in taxes. Remember, this is why he's in the Parliament to get rid of taxes and then sits there and says that before he goes to Texas the next day to actually, actually celebrate oil. The man just can't be believed. But the point here is the, the fuel excise in Australia is not a carbon price signal when it's attached to putting all of that money into more roads to create more congestion with cars that are some of the most polluting on the planet because we don't have any efficiency it? standards. Will you support it in the end if it's left as it is with all that money going to roads or if you can manage to get some of that money hypothecated to some kind of public transport systems rail? Will, will the Greens support it? We've said that we want to have a look at the legislation. We don't know how they have constructed this legislation or their hypothecation. Let me just say strongly, though, it makes no sense to have a price signal that is not driving transformative behaviour. Tony Abbott just wants this as a revenue raiser for roads. That doesn't make sense in actually transforming the economy. We need more public transport. We need mandatory vehicle fuel efficiency standards. Talking about making sense and consistency, um, I'm trying to get clarification on what your view is on the paid parental leave scheme that Tony Abbott is now talking about because it's very close to what the Greens have been proposing for a long time and yet you still say the jury's out um, while ever it's not completely funded by a, bus a tax on business. The current scheme is not funded by a tax on business. It seems like another roadblock you're putting up in front of a a policy that the Greens have long supported. 
Well, certainly we support paid parental leave as a workplace entitlement. We think that is important, but uh, we want to make sure that it's paid for by big business. But the fact is, we don't even know what the legislation is. Warren Truss has been out this week saying that it's just under design and that he wants uh, farmers' wives around Australia to be able to access paid parental leave and presumably others. Uh, he hasn't said how you would actually do that if they are not already uh, in the business as a salaried uh, employee. So let's see what they actually put on the table or but indeed if they put anything see, on the table. Why don't you send a signal to the government that you are keen on getting this through, you are keen on working it out with them? You seem to be very sort of negative saying it's all onto them. Why don't the Greens, if this is a policy you really support and believe in, why don't you push the government to come closer to you? Well, this is the government's policy and we don't know what the government's policy is. If they put up a policy position, we will look at it within the parameters I've just said, that it's uh, paid for entirely by big business. Our big push in this next two weeks is to make sure that we get renewable energy front and centre in the debate in Australia and keep carbon pricing because overwhelmingly people are beginning to realise just what a hypocrite the Prime Minister is and what a cost he is to the nation in terms of jobs and investment in renewable energy. And just finally, Senator Milne, can I ask you about um, the Clive Palmer, Palmer United Party because come July they will have a significant role, balance of power role in the Senate. Should the federal parliament be seeking answers from Clive Palmer on the serious allegations of corruption that have been levelled against him by the Queensland Newman government? Well, it's up to Clive Palmer to make clear what has happened uh, with these serious allegations of corruption. But one thing that's pretty clear is that uh, Clive Palmer, like the Prime Minister, will say and do anything uh, for a media grab. Whether it's consistent or not doesn't matter. There are serious questions to be answered uh, in terms of uh, where Clive Palmer sits. He uh, didn't vote on the repeal of the carbon price because he had a direct conflict of interest. The challenge here is that his senators abstained from the vote because clearly they will be uh, putting money straight into the companies of their leader if they vote to repeal carbon pricing. They will be just puppets of Clive and that is really something Australia needs to think about and think about very strongly. Christine Milne, thank you very much for joining us on Insiders. Thank you, Fran.